namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Series A, Dharma Talk number 28. In the last <coughs> Dharma Talk, we discussed about seven factors of enlightenment. <coughs> and today, we are going through one of each factors and try to understand it a little more in detail. Okay, the first factor of seven factors of enlightenment is sati mindfulness. We have been talking about sati from day one till now, so we are not going to elaborate too much in detail because it has been covered in every aspect that we could. Sati translated as mindfulness. It is the attentive awareness of a present object okay, or the present at the moment of arising So, it is a special kind of attention, special kind of awareness, not simple average awareness. And also this mindfulness based on your practice, the quality and the power of mindfulness also increases to various level, some very ordinary, some a little special, some become quite powerful, and some people become very superior type of mindfulness. Of course, it all depends on the practice and the skill of the yogi. And this superior kind of mindfulness are the type that penetrate or understand the true nature of mind and matter, nama and rupa, your body and your consciousness. General, average, kind, do not. This mindfulness is taught by the Buddha over 2,500 years ago. And this is the unique method, unique technique of Buddhism. He is the one who discovered and he is the actual originator or the first practitioner of this mindfulness, Satipatthana. Nowadays, especially in the West, this mindfulness is very popular, but they have their own brand of mindfulness. It applies in many different ways. But mindfulness taught by the Buddha is first and foremost, it must be a very attentive awareness of the object. When the object say it is, it can be physical or it can be mental. Awareness of an object that is arising at the moment. So it cannot be from the past, it cannot be from the future. It must be right at the present moment. And it comes to be 
and one must be aware of it as long as that object lasts. In other words, the lifespan of that object usually is a nanoseconds. You pay full attention, special attention to it, so that you know from the, the beginning of its arising to the end of the arising, and all the stages in between. So, one must be aware, very attentively, very penetratively and thoroughly. If you are aware of the object superficially, just brushed off, ah, you know there is. That is not the type of mindfulness we are talking about. It cannot be that kind of superficial knowing, brush, stroke. That is not that type. Must be very thorough, complete, attentive, and penetrative. So it has the element of effort in it. To be able to do that, one must apply effort to investigate that object. That is mindfulness. That is the type of mindfulness we like to have if you want to penetrate into the true nature of mind and matter. So it cannot be superficial, must be special and penetrative. From, for one observation, okay, you can have this special and penetrative object. But standing alone, it doesn't have the power. Standing alone, it doesn't have the power. So to build up power on that mindfulness, what you do is you must be able to observe one after the other. One object arise, pass away, another arise, pass away, another arise, pass away. Every object without missing, you must be able to note or record, record, note or record, without missing, without missing. And when you do that, what happened was the momentum built up, mindfulness momentum built up. And when it builds up, at that is the time, we can call that mindfulness powerful or strong mindfulness. Bala sati. Bala is power, strong. Sati is mindfulness. To have that strong mindfulness, you must build momentum. To get that momentum, one must be able to observe one object after the other without missing in between. That is how one's go. And also when you're observing, okay, you have another quality in there. The first one is the, what we just said is called the characteristics. How can you identify the mindfulness? How can you know it? How can you define it experientially? And then this mindfulness, they have a quality that they carry out, a job and assignment that they carry out. What that assignment is to keep it totally heatful, to keep it totally heatful. When you are heatful about a certain something, 
you don't forget. When you are heedful, you don't forget. So that is the purpose or the function of mindfulness. They don't forget the object because they are heedful. And then, of course, what does it do? Okay, we know how to identify and figure out what the correct mindfulness is and it keeps us always heedful or we don't forget. What's the use of it? The use of this is whenever you have mindfulness on every observation, that means every moment to moment to moment. There's not a moment in between that breaks. And our life, if you look at it, our life is a series of moments, series of connected moments. That is our life. Okay, we say, oh, you know, from zero to 80, zero to 90, zero to 100 years, that's how we define it. But actually, it is the continuous series of these little dots of moments connected. That is life. So if you can observe moment to moment to moment, in other words, you're observing your life. So each moment, what happens is, if you are not aware, if you are not quite conscious about that moment, at that moment, what happened? As we said, it is a life. You are facing many things, many conditions, many situations, many people. You're always facing, 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 facing these people. And along with that, actions are required. You have to do something, you have to respond to something, you have to decide something. That is life. Every moment we are facing with situation. Some are so trivial and so common we are not even aware of it, but still it is. So this moment to moment to moment you are facing all these different conditions and situations and making decisions. Okay. When you are making decisions, if you are very conscious or very aware of the whole environment or a whole set of conditions and a whole set of situations, in other words, you can see the whole picture quite clearly with details. In that way, you know what kind of decision you can make to have the most effective result. And in here, one must be aware. As a Buddhist, a practitioner, or a person who is living with mindfulness, never forget the foundation or the platform you stand on. That platform is precepts. In one word, not to harm and not to hurt anyone, including yourself, and to help and to save and to protect everybody, including yourself. That's the platform. So as you stood on that platform and you are fully aware of it, and you know exactly the best decision you can make and execute, which is beneficial for that moment or for that condition. You will make a superb decision and execute a superb sets of actions that benefit everything. And why? Because you are totally aware of the whole situation. You are mindful of the situation. But if you're not aware, okay, something happened, you just say, ah, oh, okay. When something happened, you react. Okay. 
somebody push you, the instinct is you stare back and then push back. That's a reaction. Without knowing why that push comes to be. That pushing could be because something is coming your way and then it might strike you and they try to push you so that you can escape that danger. That could be. It could be a push. A friend comes over and wants to kid you and push. Or it could be somebody who wants to provoke you and push. There could be many reasons. But if, as you are not aware of it, the first instinct is, he pushed me, I pushed back. He punched me, I punch back. Because you are not mindful. So what happened was, when you have this mindfulness, you are aware and you can make a very appropriate, proactive action. By doing so, you protect yourself from unnecessary involvement or the consequences that are going to come. So that mindfulness protects you not to make yourself a fool, not to put yourself in a position to create an enemy, and so on. That mindfulness protect you not to become a fool or not to be confrontational, create enemy. It protects you. It guards you. That is what mindfulness does. That is how mindfulness manifests into your life. Manifestation of mindfulness as a protector, as a guardian. It's not a person, it's just a mental state, but it really protects you, protects your friends, and protects your environment because you are fully aware of it. Protector, guardian, and nobody can slip into your life and create a chaos. And also, to be able to do that, we said you must be fully aware of what is happening. And one of the words it said in the book is translated as confront. Okay. You are confronting whatever is coming to you. Confront. Confront means not like putting on a standoff with an enemy, a simply you are face to face with the object that's called confront. That confrontation is also presented as manifestation. It always puts you on the confrontation mode, but confrontation without aggression. In general, when we say confrontation, there's some form of aggression in it. This is without aggression. So that is how mindfulness is beneficial to you or beneficial to anyone who is practicing. And then, how can you be mindful? Okay. What helps you to be mindful? Very general statement is, one mindfulness, if it is the true mindfulness, that mindfulness leads to another mindfulness and leads to another mindfulness. Because when you are fully aware of the situation, you are totally involved with that situation from the beginning to the end. And as soon as it's end, during the whole process, every moment is aware. As soon as it's end, of course, you come face to face with another situation. 
as you are quite acutely aware on this one, you have a certain degree of concentration power. That concentration leads, that power prompts you to be mindful with the next situation or the next object. So if you started a mindfulness, one mindfulness leads to another mindfulness leads to another mindfulness. So in a sense, mindfulness is the proximate cause of mindfulness. Mindfulness is the proximate or immediate cause of mindfulness. Of course you want to step up one more and then say, well, how can you start the first mindfulness? How can you start the first mindfulness? To be able to have that first mindfulness, one must learn how to live. Okay. Wisely. How to live wisely. Pali word is yoni so manasikara. Yoni so manasikara. They call it wise attention, wise intention, okay. wise awareness. What is this? This is you start training yourself, learning yourself to conduct your life. First of all, whenever something happened to you, just stop and think. Okay. Stop and think. Reflect. Is this thing suitable for me? Not suitable for me. Okay. Let's see, you are there and suddenly somebody is going to give you a, what do you call this thing? Ferrari or Ferrera or a car. Oh, fantastic, great, lots, very expensive. But actually it is not suitable with our lifestyle, our life. In other words, in every instances you have to check about the suitability. Or even people that you are going to associate with. This type of people, that type of people, party going people, drunken people, hiking people, outdoor people. And what are your mental bent for your life? Which type will be suitable for you? The type that is suitable for you is like minded people, somebody who thinks in general, who likes to live in general the way you do. Those are suitable people to be with, assuming you are a decent, good, caring person. Okay. And it must be because you are standing on the platform of precepts, not hurting, harming, saving. It's a, without saying it's automatic. So suitability is very important. You always think about it and you gear yourself, whether it's with the people or whether with the situation, is it suitable or is it not suitable? Suitable, not suitable. And once it is considered suitable, you're going to do something with them. When you're going to do something with them, the next one you have to ask is, is it ben beneficial? Okay, by doing so, by engaging so with this person on this project on so on and so on, will the, a certain benefit will come out. I'm not talking about profit, I'm not talking about gain. Benefit, something productive, something constructive, something useful for all who are involved. That is beneficial. Beneficiality has to be considered. And these are then you slowly think, reflect, and do things. 
And now you've got the suitability, you've got the beneficiality, and then you have to consider, okay, pretty good, so far so good. Is it appropriate? Is it appropriate? You have to consider of that execution of that a certain project. Is it appropriate? Appropriate in terms of what? Always timing. Is it the right time? And then also, is it the right place? The right time or the right place? Is it appropriate in terms of time? Appropriate in terms of place? And if so, then you engage upon it. So that is how one, step by step, think and do things carefully in life. You are starting onto this, graduate from, have all the education you acquired to face the life and you are going to face into life. And with those little programs, you start picking up, choosing, picking, choosing, and then you move on. It's very important to choose the right type of people, the suitable people. If you don't carefully choose, those people can come and hurt and harm you in future. But of course, there's a certain attraction because of that you make the instant foolish decision and later you regret because you associated with unsuitable type of people. So with those things, you engage your life in one what is called wise attention, partly what is called yoni somanasi kara. And when you do that, that will prompt you to become mindful. All these things, before you have to think, you have to figure out, you have to execute, think, figure out, execute, do. Sometimes it's right, I sometimes it's wrong, and you make correction and keep on progressing. And slowly and slowly, you become pretty confident, you become pretty slipful. When it's slipful, you don't have to be that careful, but at the same time, you can do the same kind of decision and execution okay. that could give the same kind of result. At that moment, it becomes mindfulness. You just got into an instant and you know exactly what to do instantly. Mindfulness. That's why you can also say this wise attention is the proximate cause of mindfulness. Or wise attention, wise intention, yoni sikara is the proximate cause, immediate cause of mindfulness. And then you see one mindfulness cause another mindfulness cause another mindfulness. That's the cause of mindfulness. Because many, many things, of course. We already said it, suitability, beneficiality, appropriateness, and so on, and so on, and so on. But they are all become quite compact and simply become one thing, mindfulness, and cause another mindfulness. So if you know that much about mindfulness, you have a pretty good handle on what mindfulness sati is, how to start, how to live, how to promote, and also this mindfulness depending on the quality of the mindfulness, depending on the power of the mindfulness, it can be useful for many different levels. In your daily life, in your social life, in your work life, a certain kind of mindfulness level is needed. And then just to fight off now you go and do this, starting to embark upon the spiritual path, not the 
everyday life, everyday events, spiritual path. It is pretty good to fight off your inner enemy. Okay? The inner close enemy. What is inner close enemy? It is very close to you, it's inside you, and it is fighting, attacking you all the time. That is kilisa, mental defilements. The general translation is greed, anger, and delusion, loba, dosa, and moha. When you say loba, it includes everything that you want. Little thing, little less thing. Want to have a little fresh air to breathe. Or do want to be a billionaire. Want to be famous. The world knows you. Everything. Something that you want. Or something you want to be close to. Something you want to possess. Something you want to own. Those are all loba. Those are greed. Translated as greed. But when you see the word greed, it doesn't really jive. So one must know what this loba is. That is the inner enemy. Whenever you have that want, that want or the desire or greed is pushing you to do certain things against your grain, against your principle. You want to do so much. First of all, you want to get so much. You want to own so much. You want to do as you want to do. And it is also against your principle. What do you do? You rationalize. You rationalize. Give yourself a little break with the ration rationalization and go and do it. That's what law bars do. That is the enemy. And the other one is dosa. Dosa is anger. Translated as anger. But it covers a whole spectrum. A little dissatisfaction, arrestation, frustration. Do aversion, anger, and then it becomes bigger. Hatred, ill will. Everything and anything that you don't want to associate with, that you don't want to be close to, that you want to push away, or that you want to destroy, that is dosa. That is always with you. And whenever it comes across, an object that doesn't agree with you, this guy comes into play. And if you are not mindful, they win. And then with that anger, you did something or you will do something. And then the whole nine years of consequences follow. And the next one is delusion, illusion or moha. Also translated as ignorance. What it is is this ignorance is like a it's more like a, a thin veil in front of your eyes. Okay? You can see very clearly let's say you have a 20-20 vision but you put a little clock in front of you, you cannot really see the object with clarity, with full understanding. It's always a little vague. That is called delusion or illusion because you're trying to think and guess what it could be. And that is called ignorance. So, The word is moha. Moha, if you want to know exact meaning is, it is something that covers you from truth. Something 
that covers you from truth. That mentality, that mentality more heart is something that covers you from truth. Another example will be you sitting and then sitting and looking at the water in front of you as a water and then over there that makes a little mountain, hill, trees, beautiful, quiet, you're watching. You can see everything. And suddenly, the fog roll in. Once the fog roll in, you can't see that the other side at all. Or you can see patches in between here and there. Moha is like that fog. It prevents you to see the truth. It prevents you to see the reality. So, this loba, dosa, and moha, greed, anger, and delusion, are your inner enemies. They are always working on you at every moment. They are attacking you. And one word they are called kilesa, mental defilements. So these kilesa are always attacking you every moment inside you. And the thing is, they always win. For most of the people in the world, we are always dancing the tune or the script that is set by the mental defilements. That's what we are doing, most of the people. But as we call it as an enemy, there's a way to fight back. Okay. How can we fight back and how can we win over others? Okay. We can, of course, set up the whole program and say this or that. But if you want to use just simply one word, mindfulness, mindfulness. Because those kiddies are attacking you not here and there and once in a blue moon, they are attacking you every nanosecond, every moment. And if you can keep this mindfulness every moment, they have no power over you. Because mindfulness is your guardian, because mindfulness is your protector. Mental defilement has no power over you. Mindfulness. That's what it does. It guards you and it protects you from the attack of the mental defilements. And of course, to be able to have that mindfulness in place all the time, he needs his ally. That ally is effort. Effort has to come. What does effort do? Effort is always pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. Because we are facing the mental defilements. Mental defilements is always there attacking you. They are always advancing, looking for a loophole and effort always pushing back. Along with the effort, mindfulness is guarding every loophole. Effort, push back mindful defilements. Mindfulness, guard and stop the entrance of the mental defilements. And then when you have a powerful mindfulness, which is continuous with full momentum. When you have that, automatically you got another ally. Only when you have the strong momentum mindfulness, strong mindfulness, another ally pops up. That is the concentration. Concentration is more like a great coordinator it unites all the forces around. Okay. 
Effort is walking on its own. Mindfulness is walking on its own. And you know there's another mental factor. Sadda, faith and confidence, is wanting, walking on its own. But when this concentration pops up, what he does is he's just like a central supervisor. He knows who is doing what at any time. And he tried to coordinate and he tried to unite all these mental factors together. So what happened is just like a one piece of string. It's only have the strength of one. But when you have a whole bunch of string and united together, it become a very strong rope. You can't break. That's what concentration samadhi does. When that concentration rolls in, unites everybody, and that area is totally saved from the mental defilements. Mental defilements does not and cannot coexist with concentration. They are like fire and water. More fire burning, not much water, it will keep on going. But if there's lots of water coming in, the fire is gone. Like fire and water, mental defilement and mental concentration. But mental concentration doesn't join in right away. It has to have a very strong and powerful mindfulness. Only then it pops up and it unites every other mental element which fights against the kilesa, mental defilements. That's how it was come. But again, who started this? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. So, that is how mindfulness plays in the fight against mental defilements, in the fight against the inner enemy that you have. So if we know enough that much, okay, we can live, we can handle our life with ease against all odds and all difficulties and trouble. So to be able to have this kind of mindfulness, how to develop mindfulness, okay, is first and foremost is, probably what is called sampajanya. Sampajanya means, in general, one must learn how to be mindful at all things at any time. In general, in your daily life, I'm not talking about meditative, moment-to-moment -moment intense mindfulness. When you're walking, know that you're walking. When you're sitting, know that you're sitting. When you're eating, know that you're eating. When you're showered, know that you're showering. When you see a friend, know that you see a friend. When you want to go for a hike, know that you want to go for a hike and know that you're hiking and know that you have climb up on top of the mountain. All these daily activities that you are doing socially, professionally, leisurely, vacationally, everything have that little general awareness of everything. That general awareness of all things that you are engaging in your life will really support you when you want to develop powerful mindfulness superior mindfulness. And then, of course, one must have, that's Yoni Sikara. In this kind of general situation, you always have to consider, hmm, are these the right guy? Or is it the right group? Is it the right crowd? and so on and so forth. Suitability, beneficiality. Yeah. There are times that you simply sit down and think. That kind of thing. And thirdly, 
don't hang out with the people who are not mindful, which means people who just love to party or people who just love to go to a bar or most of the time spending most of the hours shopping or sitting down and just shooting breeze, that kind of thing. Those kind of people are called unmindful people. Do not hang around with them. Of course, sometimes you have to because the situation demands it, but do not make it a priority. If possible, don't at all. And then finally, Hang out with the people who are mindful. When other people are mindful, they are right in front of you. You are associating with them, you are doing things with them. The way they keep themselves composed and mindful automatically remind you of to be more mindful. Again, simply, these two associating with unmindful people and associating with the mindful people, not associating and associating. It shows you one of the major points of Buddhism. It can be seen everywhere. We are the environmental condition product. Whatever our environment is conditioning us, that's what we become. Know that. You live in Burma. Burmese conditioning makes you a certain character. You live in Canada. Canada environment conditioning you to become a certain type of people. And so on. We are the product of our environment the condition of our environment. That's the key thing. And we must be very aware and mindful of it. And do everything that is good and wholesome that your environment has to offer and resist, avoid doing anything that is not good and unwholesome what your environment, tradition, and culture is telling you. Don't follow your culture, don't follow your tradition, don't follow the religion of your environment if it is not good and wholesome. If it is hurtful and harmful, avoid at all costs. That is the point, don't associate it with unmindful people, associate with mindful people. That too comes out of what we just say. We are the product of our conditioned environment. So with that, I think it's plenty to know and understand what mindfulness is. And that mindfulness First of all, it become a powerful, and then you keep on developing that powerful mindfulness become a superior mindfulness. Superior mindfulness, by definition, is you do not miss any moment anymore. Every waking moment you are aware. Let's assume you are in a retreat, and in that retreat, from the moment you wake up till you fall asleep, you do not miss one beat. That kind of thing is superior mindfulness. If you can approach that kind of mindfulness, if you are approaching that kind of mindfulness, you can penetrate or you can understand the true nature of mind and matter explicitly. In other words, you will get enlightened. So that's the first factor of the seven factors of enlightenment, mindfulness. So 
may all of you be able to develop all qualities of mindfulness. Protect yourself from all dangers and trouble of our society and daily life and eventually penetrate into the true nature of mind and matter and attain Nibbana as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 Buddham Bhujemi. Dhammam Bhujemi. Sangam Pujemi Thank you very much. <laughs>